Is it possible that the internet's craziest conspiracy theorists may, for the first time, be right? And then we take a look at the saga of the Phantom Patriot. When a real-life superhero decides to stop fighting crime on the streets and takes it right to the front door of the elites, can this man actually take down the Illuminati, or will he die trying? Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. Hope you guys are having a great day too. I hope you guys are having tons of fun doing whatever you're doing. We got a jam-packed episode, so we're going to get started right away. First off, running into Dead Rabbit Radio Command. Everyone get on your feet and give it up for Brady. Woohoo, yeah, we, (laughs) ha ha, yeah, Brady is all running in to Dead Rabbit Radio Command. Brady... Along with his friend August, they came out. August is going to get their own shout out, but they came out to see me at the Oregon Ghost Conference give the presentation. I think they are now the ones who've seen me the most live. <laughs> Other than my friends and my family, Brady and August have come out to see me at Oregon Ghost Conference twice and the Port Gamble Ghost Conference. A lot of love to all of those who could make it and a lot of love to those who can't. I understand. I <laughs> understand not everyone can travel to Oregon at the drop of a hat. But Brady, you're going to be our captain, our pilot this episode as a reward uh, for being able to get out there. If you guys can't support the show financially, if you guys can't travel to Oregon to go to ghost conferences, that's fine too. It really, really is. Just help spread the word about Dead Rabbit Radio. That helps out so much. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone you know. Dead Rabbit Radio is your favorite paranormal show. Also, I always forget to mention this. uh, Patreon supporters get ad-free versions of the episode. So that's another bonus. And Discord access and all that stuff. But Brady, you're going to be our captain, our pilot this episode. Let's go ahead and get this party started. I'm going to toss you the keys to the Dead Rabbit Dirigible. Brady, hop on board and get ready to pilot us out of Dead Rabbit Radio Command and fly us all the way down to Tennessee. (laughs) This beautiful blimp. Flying across the great United States. Actually, uh, before we completely leave the state of Oregon, we got to stop off and pick up a local friend. Uh, Let's pull up to this house. We see a house sitting in the middle of the suburbs. We see a man walking around. A man, a true man. Not like me. I'm a woman. A true man. A tall, thin man. (laughs) You're like, wait, Jason, what? You're a woman? What's going on here? We see a true man, a biological male, tall, gangly, walking out of his house, his limbs nice and long like a man's should be. We see him, like, in his front yard. He's looking around, and he breathes in a big, fresh breath of manly air. And then we see his wife walk out. Beautiful woman. Not like me. Not like me. I'm an ugly woman. This is a beautiful woman. An actual woman. We see her wrap her short, stubby, chubby arms around her. I don't know what I don't know what his wife looks like. To be fair, I hope it's not an insult. It's Hans Vermhat. Everybody. Hans Vermhat is walking around his house. I've learned a couple things about Hans over the years. If you guys don't know who Hans is, we've been talking about him on and off the show. I'll put some episodes in the show notes. Four years. Most famously, he is the guy who proposed that monkeys don't exist. Still to this day, one of my favorite conspiracy theories. Monkeys don't exist. Every time you've seen a monkey which to be fair isn't often (laughs) unless you live in the jungle you don't see monkeys that often unless you're a zookeeper you rarely see a monkey every time you see a monkey it's a man in a suit if it's a dude if it's like man-sized it's a man in the suit so like a gorilla an orangutan who's that big big red one that was in a planet of the apes the Dr. Zayas guy. That's an orangutan, right? There's puffy cheeks. 
orangutans. Those are humans in suits. If you see a small monkey, that is a puppet. It's either animatronic or it's someone's hand stuck inside of it. It's fake. <laughs> You're trying to wait a second. Like, what are you remembering every time you've seen a monkey swinging through a tree? It's fake. That was fake. That episode, those episodes we did about monkey torture videos, don't feel bad about it. They were just robots. Monkeys don't exist. And the reason why Hans Vermhat believes monkeys don't exist is that it's a trick from the scientific community to make us believe in evolution. Monkeys are not real. They've never existed. And the scientists created the monkey, not in a laboratory, like they threw it off like they made schematics. And that way they can go see how close humans are to the animal kingdom. Look at this ape. Look at this ape over here. Eating that banana. You like bananas, don't you? And you're like, yeah, sure, they're okay. And then, then that's your uncle. That's your uncle over there. Evolution is real. That's the reason why monkeys are fake. It's to trick us into believing in evolution. That's a super interesting conspiracy theory. We've gone over it a couple times on the podcast. Like, that's actually a pretty intriguing conspiracy theory. I, and I wonder if he did not live in a world, if he did not live in America. I found out he lives in Oregon. Because one day, which where I live in Oregon, one day he was releasing a video and he's like, oh, our stupid governor, I hate her. Uh, who was the governor? Kate Brown. Kate Brown, I hate her. And I was like, oh my God, yes, yes. The chances of me running into Hans and having a conversation went up exponentially now that I learned we both live in the same state. He believes the color orange is evil. He believes space is fake. Right now, he's kind of ditched the moniker Hans Vermhat, which I learned uh, from you guys. You guys helped me out with this. Comes from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. I love that show, but I never made the connection. That was Char one of Charlie's characters he made up in a book. Now, Hans uh, Vermhat, Hans Wormhat, goes by the uh, name Repent for the Kingdom of Heaven is at Hand. Or R-K-F-T-O-H-I. A -H. Just doesn't have the same ring to it. Doesn't have the same ring to it. Sorry. Should have gone with Dr. Mantis Toboggan just to keep the same theme going. But a lot of craziness over the years. We've covered him a lot. He believes that there's no slaves. There was never a transatlantic slave trade. He thinks that was all made up. <laughs> Pretty much a big chunk of American history that just never happened, according to him. He has all these conspiracy theories. But what happens when... Hans is right. What happens when this guy, the craziest conspiracy theorist on the internet, is right? This is super fascinating because, I, I, you know, I check in on him from time to time. I'm actually subscribed to his channel. He's pretty prolific. He's constantly putting stuff out. The other day in the news, and the story went pretty viral, and it's funny, I, I would see the story pop up a lot, and I go, oh, that's interesting, but it's not really Dead Rabbit Radio interesting, you know, I'm not going to talk about it. It was when Hans mentioned it that it really go, maybe, maybe this guy is onto something, because this story went viral, and you almost couldn't avoid it. We're in Tennessee, we're about to meet this young man, well, he's in his 50s, but, um... His name is Victor Shara. He's 59 years old from Tennessee. And what happened was one morning he woke up and he walked into his living room. He shared a place with a roommate. And when the roommate looked over at Victor, Victor freaked out. His roommate looked like a goblin with pointy ears and elongated facial features, and it just looked like this monstrous face. Hello, Victor. Where's the gold? <laughs> Where's the gold? Can I steal the gold? I'll be having that. Running around the house, and Victor's like, ah, totally freaking out. Now, Victor knew that this was his roommate. It still looked like his roommate, but just a goblinized version of his roommate. And of course, you know, he thinks he's going crazy. He thinks he's losing his mind. So Victor leaves the house 
And he sees people walking down the street with these goblin faces. Ah, yes, off to the mines to rob dwarves. We don't march. We don't get gold ourselves. We're goblins. <laughs> They're all singing a song. There's like a synchronized thing. One of them's on like a wagon full of TNT. They're going down to the mines. <laughs> like, why? I know Tennessee has some mines, but I don't remember all these goblins. Who are the dwarves? What's going on here? Goblin this and goblin that. We're just goblin doing all that. <laughs> they're not really good. They're not really good singing songs. They're goblins. They need to practice. So, anyways, what happens is it turns out that Victor he goes to the doctor. <laughs> he goes to the doctor. The doctors all dance, and the nurses have the synchronized goblin. Welcome to the goblin's cave. The goblin's cave. <laughs> So walking with earplugs, he's like, okay, the hallucinations, the visual hallucinations I can deal with, but what's up with all these goblin songs? He goes to the doctor, and he gets diagnosed with something called prosometamorphosia. Prosometamorphosia. It is uh, what it kind of sounds like it makes people's faces change. It, uh, it's visual distortion of other humans' faces. Apparently, it doesn't work on inanimate objects, so you wouldn't look at a car and it's all ka -chow! Jump in me! Let's go to Diesel Falls or whatever. Looks at a house, it's just the house, but it looks at a person, looks like a goblin. Very, very rare disease. About 75 people have it. Or at least they've diagnosed 75 cases of it, and they didn't even say like what the timeline was that for. Past 10 years, past 20 years. It's not a permanent condition, but it can last a couple of years. Usually it's a couple of days to a couple of weeks. What the uh, doctors were able to do with Victor, and this is where the news article went viral, because all of a sudden you had these um, visual aids for it. When he looked at a picture of someone, it was normal. But when he looked at their face in real life, it was monstrous. It was a little goblin face. What they ended up doing was they ended up taking photos, I assume of people nearby, right? Because what happened was you would take a photo of a person's face and it would be a normal person. But then Victor would look at that person in real life and describe what he was seeing. So they were able to go in and basically using like Photoshop, change the face the picture of the face to make it look like what he was seeing because otherwise he'd be saying they look like monsters they look like monsters like that's pretty vague so there's a bunch of photos of like a normal face of the next to it the face is like stretched out the eyes are stretched out i'm sure a couple of you guys have seen this in the pointy ears they always have these three wrinkles on the cheeks and so they were able to for the first time show us and for the first time the doctors got to really get a good glimpse of what sufferers of this disease were seeing. And the story went all over. Like, it was viral. They were talking about it on the mainstream news. They were talking about it on the X board. Everybody was talking about this. From the fringe conspiracy people to the mainstream news. And this is super interesting. Like, that's interesting enough, but it's such a visual story. It's Really hard to cover on the podcast, but what's so interesting is Hans Vermhat comes out swinging, knocks it out of the park. Grand slam on this one because he has a conspiracy theory about this, and this is really dope. He's saying, what if, what if the reason why this story is going viral is because something's going to happen and more and more people are going to start having this disease, quote-unquote, having this disease. But what's really happening is the mask literally is slipping. Is it possible that there are entities that exist among the human population that look like this, that are these monstrous-faced humans that are perfectly disguised but something's going to happen soon that's going to cause this illusion to stumble. And the reason why this story's going viral, let's say that tomorrow you're at the bank, you're standing in line and you look over and you see the bank guard has a face, has a goblin face. And you look kind of around the room and people look normal, no one else is reacting to the goblin standing there in the uniform with the gun. 
And then you see the bank manager come out and she has a goblin face as well. Instead of freaking out, instead of going, we're being overrun, we're being overrun by these monsters in human form. You may go, wow, I, I, <laughs> you may go to the doctor. I think that would probably be your first stop. But you may go to the doctor because you're thinking, I saw an article about this recently. I saw an article that there's some sort of mental disease that makes me see monsters when there's just normal humans. So you go to the doctor and the doctor goes, yeah, you suffer from this disease. It should go away in a couple of weeks. What if the mask will slip off and more and more of us will become aware of these creatures living among us. And that's why the story is going viral. So we won't panic. So we won't grab the shotgun and all the bubble gum we can find. We won't straight up. They live half the population of your town. In fact, if you see these monsters appear, you will assume there's nothing wrong with them. There's something wrong with you. That's a really good conspiracy theory. I mean, hats off to Hans. That's a really, really good one. Because like I said, I was seeing these articles pop up everywhere. Thought it was interesting. Didn't think much of it. That would make sense. That you would want to get ahead of this. Whether it's a mystical illusion or a sci-fi camouflage generator. Whatever. Anything in between. The powers that be expect something is going to go wrong with it. And so they're already putting it out there. Well, if you see faces that look weird, just go to the doctor because there might be something wrong with your head. Nothing too serious, but still go to the doctor. It's not us. It's you. That's a really good conspiracy theory. I mean, again, like a broken clock can be right twice a day. I'm not saying he's right, but it's definitely a fun conspiracy theory. And uh, who knows, right? That, that, that's a big thing in the conspiracy theory community. Obviously, you have all sorts of conspiracy theories. A lot of people who believe, there's people who believe the elite are ruling the world and it's corporations and families and private enterprises, all this stuff that's turning the globe into their slave state. And then there's the sci-fi version of that, where it's not just these families. You have them either, you have them, in league with reptilians, or they actually are reptilian invaders. And then you have the fantasy, or I don't want to say fantasy because it's made up, but like the the fantasy version where it's demons. So I mean fantastical like that, like demons and arch lords and dukes of hell and stuff like that. Not fantasy as in it's not real. Very interesting conspiracy theory, very interesting video from Hans Vermhat. Is that possible? Is that the reason why that story went viral? was because it, when it starts happening to us, we won't think it's actually the veil slipping, that we're actually surrounded by monsters. Will it simply be us going to the doctor and being like, well, I remember seeing that article. It went viral. Everyone saw it. Uh, I need to go get my head checked out. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. Brady, let's go ahead and toss you the keys to the world. Famous carpenter copter. We are leaving behind... Tennessee, fly us all the way out to Texas. It's the early 1980s. We're headed off to Six Flags Astro World, and everyone's like on a roller coaster. Wee! They're all spinning around, and then like some kids are running around with cotton candy. I'm eating it up, and mom's like, "Don't eat too much cotton candy." You'll get diabetes. It's a beautiful sunny day in Six Flags Astro World, and it's the early 1980s. We're at the stunt show. There's a Batman stunt show in progress. Dun, 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 Batman. The guy's jumping around, and then like the Riddler shows up. He's like, I'll get you, Batman. And Batman's throwing batarangs and hitting Riddler in the face. Uh, and then the penguin shows up and goes, Waka waka, Batman, you'll never stop me. And Batman, like, Throws a gas grenade at him. If you think about it, Batman pretty much can mob any of his villains. They're not strong. They constantly have to outwit him, but he's the world's greatest detective. And we're impressed by all the stuff Batman's doing. He's running around. But little do we realize the man playing Batman, the guy in that Batman costume, is about to become a real-life superhero himself. 
and he will truly use his powers of deduction and physical prowess to save the world. Richard McCaslin, he's in his mid-20s in the early 80s, lifelong comic book fan, loves the idea of superheroes. It's just his dream job right now to be able to dress up as Batman and entertain people. He always wanted to get into the entertainment business. Be an actor. He recently has gotten out of the Marines. He gets a job at Six Flags Astro World as a Batman stuntman. But while he's doing that, he hears about the real life superhero phenomenon. He comes across stories about people patrolling the streets in some ma- in, in multiple major cities of the United States, whether it's the Guardian Angels, which was more of just a vigilante street gang, or you just had people dressing up in costumes trying to fight crime. That's what he wanted to do. And listen, he had training as a Marine. He was also a martial artist. And he thinks, I can actually do this myself. I can actually save people's lives. It's fun being Batman, jumping off of this giant water tower, and kids going, yay, clapping. But, I mean, what if I could do that in real life? He decides to become a superhero, and he calls himself the Lynx. Like the cat, not the golf. In Zanesville, Texas, he begins patrolling the town with his teenage sidekick, Ironclaw, who reportedly was the very first teenage sidekick in the real-life superhero movement. He does that for quite a few years as the Lynx, he's patrolling the street. Now, but we've done a couple episodes on real-life superheroes. If, you're, if this is your first time hearing about this phenomenon, I know that what you want it to be, what I want it to be, was him standing in the shadows, in an alleyway, and some guy's like, hey, kid, come here, you want some drugs? Well, um, I guess, yeah, dude, take this crack, you know what, I'll give you extra, take it to school, get all your kids addicted. Okay, Mr. Drug Dealer. And then you want the Lynx to jump out of the shadow (laughs) after the kid's already got the drugs, he's all smoking it, he's halfway to the school, Lynx jumps out of the shadows, he's a little too late, and beats up the drug dealer and says, you deal this poison, on your side of town. Not here. Or <laughs> drug dealers say, well, okay, I can do that. I can, I can cross the street. That's my side of town. No, I mean, you take your poison home and shove it. I don't want to ever see you on this side or any side of town. And the drug dealer's like, okay, okay, I'll, I won't do it. By the way, what's your name? And he goes, wow, the Lynx. The drug dealer's like, like golf club like a fence no like the cat that's what you'd want it to be right you'd want to have vigilantes jumping out of the shadows or like there's a mob meeting in a building and they're like so we all agree drugs are the greatest and school sucks and all the mobsters are like yeah yeah and then all of a sudden the link smashes through the window and he's like throwing gas grenades everywhere and they're like whoa this this makes me reconsider my life of crime oh no i got tear gas in my eyes I'm going to open a deli instead. And the Lynx is like beating up all these mobsters. You keep your poison out of this city. Because this city belongs to the Lynx. And everyone's like, oh. (laughs) They can't see that he's dressed up like a giant cat. And they're like, I don't know. What does the Lynx mean? Sausage Lynx? No. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Because if that was the case, (laughs) all these real-life superheroes would be active for probably one or two nights before they got shot in the back of the head. A lot of times they observe and report crimes, so they'll... 911, what's your emergency? Ah, yes, I observe all. Crime has a grip on this city. And they're like, Lynx, just tell us where you're at and what you're seeing. Okay, okay. Uh, There's a drug dealer here on the street. I'm on 7th and Broadway. Okay, we'll send a patrol unit out. They observe and report, and they hand out food to the homeless. And while those things are good, they're not cool. They don't make it any cooler if you dress up like a superhero, handing sandwiches out to homeless people. So it is basically a lot of that. And, you know, you're just walking down the street and you're dressed up like a giant cat or whatever his costume looked like. And you'd probably, I mean, like, if you're trying to buy drugs, (laughs) you're probably like, "Ah, I don't know, I don't know. I could go on the other side of town and buy drugs. This one, every so often a cat walks by, a human-sized cat called the Lynx. Uh, I'll go buy drugs somewhere else. So, I mean, you know, sometimes it can help, I guess. That's the real-life superhero movement in a nutshell. 
Well, he's doing this in the 80s. By the time the 90s rolls around, if you're a comic book fan, all the comic books became darker. It was really like the nirvana izing of comic books. They became dark and grungy. A lot of superheroes got a makeover, a more hardcore makeover. The Lynx was no exception. He stopped. Richard stopped going by the name The Lynx. Probably got tired of describing it. And became Crackdown. Which was a more edgy superhero. Also, basically his name describes it. He doesn't like crack. It's going down. Crackdown. He changed his name to that in the 90s. Also at that time, this was super interesting because I read multiple narratives of this guy and I kept thinking, because he gets some crazy gadgets as his career goes on. We're just scraping the surface. I hope this episode doesn't go too long. I'm reading him. I was like, how does this guy have so much money? How does this guy have the money to do anything? He's doing all of this stuff. It turns out, unfortunately, in the 90s, both of his parents passed away. So he inherited $675,000 in the 90s. So it was worth even more. And while he is able to get some wonderful toys with that money, including a bunker in the middle of the desert, which, to be fair, you know, the story ends where he's living in Nevada. <laughs> Basically, any, any place there is the middle of the desert. But he puts his money to good use as far as uh, superhero gadgets go. We'll get to that in a second. But his parents die in the 90s. He inherits over $600,000 in 90s money, which is probably close to a million dollars a day. He became cracked down. He did that in the 90s. But when the 2000s rolled around, he changed his name once more. And it would be the name that becomes immortalized because this guy's going to go on quite an event. I'm surprised I had never heard of this guy. I'm surprised I've never heard of this guy. In the 2000s, he changes his name once more to the Phantom Patriot. That is what you think it is. He actually has his own theme song. <laughs> There's not many people we cover on this show that have their own theme song. Uh, that song's been stuck in my head. The Phantom Patriot. It's fantastic. I don't even have a theme song. I mean, my podcast does, but I don't. Uh, Phantom Patriot. He looks the part he looks like a ghost version of Captain America. Not like he's see-through or anything like that. But he has on a skull mask. He wears he has different types of masks, but one of them is this cool skull mask. A red, white, and blue uniform with this really cool design. Phantom Patriot, PP, right? He takes the P's and he turns them backwards and it makes like a skull logo. Like he puts them back to back. Fantastic. I mean, 10 out of 10 costume design for a real life superhero. Phantom Patriot. He has a stop sign, like a stop sign shield. <laughs> That's kind of phoning it in at that point. It's a little on the nose, too. Stop. He just holds it up. That He didn't really design that. He just probably stole that. He probably committed a crime. There's a bunch of car accidents at a certain intersection, but he has his shield. And on one shoulder, he has a picture of a donkey. And on the other shoulder, he has a picture of an elephant. And both of them are crossed out because he's making a political statement. The parties that control America suck. Whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, rat, or a Demo, Democrat would probably work. Whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, he doesn't care. Band of Patriots thinks you're both lame. <laughs> what does any of that have to do with crime fighting? Now he's like lecturing people. He's breaking up these mob meetings and he's like, and by the way, vote Tuesday, but vote for a third party. He's all getting people in the face. They're like, ah. He is political this time. He's a political vigilante. He also, this is when I'm talking about gadgets. He has the Patriot bike, 
It's like motorcycle. Red, white, and blue motorcycle. He has the Patriot Mobile. He has a mag light. <laughs> Jason, you can buy one of those. It's 12 bucks. If you're impressed by a mag light, Jason, uh, I think you need more Patreon money. <laughs> you're like, wow, 12 bucks on a flashlight. This guy's rich. He also has a crossbow. Now, again, crossbows aren't very expensive. They're illegal to own in Hood River. You can't have a crossbow. You actually can't even have a slingshot. It's weird. You can carry and conceal... You can carry and conceal a firearm. Walking around Hood River, you can have a three fifty seven tucked into your pants, but heaven forbid you have a crossbow or a slingshot. He has a crossbow. He does also have firearms. He does also have rifles... And pistols. He has this... I had to look this up. He has a special type of shotgun slash rifle. And it's real. Uh, People say they totally suck. Um, But it's definitely intimidating looking. The reason why it sucks is so it's like a pump action shotgun, right? That's pretty dope. But it's also... I know you guys aren't going to believe me. You guys are going to be like, Jason got some detail wrong. I'll put it in the show notes so you can watch the YouTube review. It's a pump-action shotgun, and it's also a pump-action rifle. So it shoots off like a standard 5.56 round, like an AR-15 type round, but you have to pump it between each shot. <laughs> I was watching the YouTube video. It's all jamming up. The guy's like, it's not a good gun. I'm doing a review on it to tell you guys this gun stinks. Pump-action shotgun, pump-action rifle built into one. Anyways, Phantom Patriot, his job is to take down crime at the highest level and who are the bigger criminals in our society it's not the drug dealers it's not the mobsters it's the politicians but he's not just a man of action he's a man of passion because richard mccaslin loves shaley wright shaley wright's not some local girl down at the yogurt shop that richard's been pining after all these years no she's i never heard of her before but apparently she's a fairly popular country music star early 2000s late 90s shaley wright he ends up attending a charity event where one of the prizes one of the things you could bid on was a dinner with Shaylee Wright. And uh, Phantom Patriot's like, oh, dude, I don't know if he showed up in his costume. That would be hilarious. Because it's not going to be hilarious in a second. This is the dark side of his story. Um, Richard says, oh, my God, I'm really in love with Shaylee Wright. Um, And now I get to meet her? Now I can actually win a dinner date with her? Not Probably just a dinner, not a date, but... I can have a dinner with Shaylee Wright, the woman I love the most. So he goes to this charity event. And he bids a $14,000 bid. And apparently wins a dinner with Shaylee Wright. Now what's interesting is there is a lot of stuff written about this guy. I, at a certain point, had to just call the research because I was finding more and more information about this guy. At a certain point, I'm watching a YouTube video review of the rifle he ends up using later on in the story. But through all that research, I could not find whether or not they actually went out to that dinner date. Because it's possible that her or her people or the people who organized the event go, "Mm, no, something's off with this guy. He showed up wearing a suit and he has a stop sign. It's kind of weird. I don't know if he showed up as the Phantom Patriot. I would assume not. But apparently he did win the dinner dinner with Shaylee Wright. He did not... I could not find how if they went on it or what happened during that night. He's like, so do you like crime? I don't. He does end up stalking her. We do know that whether or not they went to dinner, whether or not they actually took his $14,000, we don't know. He did end up stalking her. He sent a VHS tape. He sent a VHS tape to her brother. I don't know what the contents of that were. Probably not good. If it it was good, it probably wouldn't have been mentioned in the part about him stalking a woman. And at one point, I guess, he showed up to one of her concerts and he was spotted by security. So, 
again, because the story's older, uh, some of the details I think have been lost to time. I was trying to find what I could, but apparently they knew that he was trying to contact her in not the nicest of terms, i.e. stalking her. So they were on alert for him to be at a concert, and sure enough, they caught him at a concert of Shaylee's, and he was trying to pass a note to her. I don't know what the note said. I don't know what was on the VHS tape. But it definitely was upsetting to her. But stalking aside, right? And that does give us kind of a glimpse of a darker side of the Phantom Patriot. Why are we talking about him? Like, in general, real-life superheroes are super cool. Very, very interesting subculture to look at. We've talked about him multiple times on this show. But Phantom Patriot goes above and beyond and crosses over from fighting crime on the streets to trying to take out the big fishes themselves. January 19th, January 20th, 2002, Phantom Patriot is driving his truck down a forested road. He stops it and he gets out and he walks through the forest. Destination? Bohemian Grove. If you guys don't know, I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with it, but a quick overview. Bohemian Grove, every summer, it's basically a gathering of very powerful men. Only men. Women aren't allowed. Hans, Hans could go there all day long. I would be left out. Only men, powerful men, rich men, generally conservative men, Republicans. Uh, Bill Clinton famously said when someone asked him about if he'd ever been to Bohemian Grove, he said, and I'm paraphrasing here, why would I want to hang out with a bunch of naked Republicans? That, 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 that quote has been flown around for over a decade at this point. Um, basically, it's a getaway for powerful men. And they have this whole ritual where they have this giant owl statue. And it gives this little speech. It's like a pre-recorded speech recorded by Walter Cronkite. This is all public information. I mean, like, Bohemian Grove is not a conspiracy theory. What really becomes a conspiracy theory because people go, well, what actually happens there? What we what we've been told happens there is that all these rich, powerful people go there to hang out in the woods and get drunk, and they have this ceremony where they take the effigy of a person. It's like a bundle that's supposed to look like a body, and they put it in front of this owl and they burn it. And it's supposed to be burning all the cares and responsibilities of the previous year to kind of give you a fresh start. It's very paganistic ritual. On the best hand of it, it's a way for uh, rich and powerful people to get together and to talk unimpeded about what they want to do, uh, goals they have, networking, things like that. Uh, And it's like a drinking society of a very, very high class of men. On the worst side of it is you hear stories about, I came across a story recently, this guy says, when I was a little kid at Bohemian Grove, they kidnapped me and a bunch of other kids and made us dress up like teddy bears. While the song Teddy Bear Picnic was playing on a loop, we had to run through the forest as all of these men were hunting us down and killing us. So that's not in the Wikipedia article. You're not going to find that really anywhere else. I'll put that in the show notes where I found that. But that's the worst side of it. People say that it's uh, they're actually burning a real human body. It's not a body in effigy. They're hunting teddy bear people. I think the worst part of that is having to hear teddy bears picnic for eight hours on a loop as you're trying to hide in the darkness as your uh, fellow kids are getting gunned down. But anyway, so that is the the worst level of the conspiracy theory. The 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 best it could be is just a bunch of people sitting around making plans for the coming year, a social club. Anyways, um, it's known very well in conspiracy theory circles. Famously, Alex Jones, this is what really put him on the map. He used to be kind of a local cable access guy in Texas until in the early 2000s, really early 2000, like 2000, 2001, he snuck into Bohemian Grove and videotaped a bunch of stuff. That really put him on the map. That's when he became a national figure. Well, Phantom Patriot was a huge fan of Alex Jones. And he decided he wanted to go to Bohemia Grove as well, but he was going to do more than what Alex Jones did. Because Alex Jones showed up during the actual ceremony. 
Phantom Patriot had another plan in mind. He actually stopped by the public access studio and talked to Alex Jones briefly before going. He did not tell Alex Jones what he was going to do, but he talked to him and they chatted for a bit and then Phantom Patriot left. I don't know if he showed up in his full costume. I'm sure Alex Jones would have appreciated that if he did. But um, Phantom Patriot stops, talks to Alex Jones for a bit and then gets in his car and he drives all the way out to Bohemian Grove. I should tell you, Bohemian Grove is in California. Um, I I guess I left that part off. Anyways, he goes out, he visits Jones, he goes to California to go to the Bohemian Grove. It's in the middle of the forest. When he gets there, it's the off-season, so the only people there are staff and security. Phantom Patriot gets out of his car and he has his MK1 assault rifle shotgun combo. Call MK1 handgun crossbow, a two foot long sword, which was another weapon that he liked to carry. Again, <laughs> generally he's handing out sandwiches to homeless people and calling the cops when he sees a crime. But he's kitted out, two foot long sword. He has a knife, a homemade got a homemade smoke grenade launcher, and a camouflaged Bible. I didn't even know they made those, but it kind of makes sense. Camouflage Bible. He parks his car when he's walking around the Bohemian Grove. He actually is able to find his way to the place, but it's dark. And his flashlight dies. His his famous mag light that I was so impressed by. The batteries die on it. So now he's standing in a pitch black forest. He's never been in this area before. There may or may not be a teddy bear picnic about to commence. There may be a bunch of kids running around in teddy bear costumes. He doesn't have a flashlight. He's stumbling around in the dark. He doesn't know where he's going. He's able to find a cabin. So he breaks into the cabin and spends the night there. You can just imagine if this totally true story. Multiple news articles have been written about this event. I'm shocked I did not know any of this. Imagine if the staff happened to come into that cabin, and you see a man sleeping there, camouflage Bible in hand. Next to him, a crossbow, a shotgun rifle, and a two-foot-long sword. The guy's dressed like a superhero. Luckily, or unluckily, I guess, you could say, depending on what side you're on, nobody found him. That would probably give anyone a heart attack if they stumbled across that. Well, he wakes up the next morning. The sun's up. It's time for him to continue his mission. He finally makes his way to the giant owl statue. Which some people say represents Moloch. So truly paganistic, if you buy that. Some people say it's just an owl. Just an owl. It's just the symbol of evil, a world round. Some people consider it the symbol of knowledge, but no, it's just an owl. And other people go, no, that's actually supposed to be a demonic entity. But he finally finds the giant owl, and he goes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set it on fire. I'm going to burn down the owl. Which, listen, man, whatever you think about Bohemian Grove, it is populated by the richest, most powerful people, at least on the conservative side. And I'm sure there's I'm sure there's people from different political parties, but that would be the equivalent if if everyone you burn down the owl, that would be the equivalent of it's a Tuesday morning. Everyone walks into Wall Street, the big Wall Street building, the Nasdaq, whatever it's called, and all the computers are flipped over. <laughs> all the computers are flipped over. All the screens are smashed. And that little ticker tape thing is destroyed. And the bell that people ring in the morning, you punched it. You left a big dent in it. Do people stay there all night? I wonder if they do have security. <laughs> I'm planning my next trip to New York City. I was like, oh, that'd be hilarious. I'm all just kicking monitors open. That would be the same thing, right? Imagine if the president woke up and went to the Oval Office and his desk was flipped over. It'd just be kind of hilarious. Highly criminal, but um, hilarious nonetheless. So anyways, he goes, I'm going to burn the owl down. (laughs) I'm going to burn down this effigy. And that'll be a blow against these people who think they rule us. But what he doesn't know is the owl is made of concrete. For whatever reason, and I don't know if anyone ever expressly said it was this way, if he just assumed it, he thought it was made out of wood. It's actually a giant concrete owl. 
And he's like, well, I can't set concrete on fire. That's not, <laughs> unless I have a backpack full of hot lava. That plan's kind of out. So what he decides to do is he wrote some notes. He wrote, scribbled out some notes and wrote down some Bible verses and left them at the foot of the owl. I don't know either. I do not know what he wrote down. I'd love to know what message he... I mean, this is huge, right? I mean, Alex Jones did this, and then about a year or two later, this guy did this. And as far as we know, it's never been done since. There was a video of that show, uh, what was it called, like History Decoded or something? It was by the guy who wrote, um, not the Da Vinci Code, but uh, like these books. He wrote these books about like solving codes and something like that. <laughs> Real accurate information off the top of my head. Him and a film crew for a History Channel show, they went to Bohemian Grove. They took boats down and they actually got onto the shore and they were chased out by security and a big problem that they had was that they brought a woman with them because one of the cast members of this show was a woman brad metzger i think might be the author's name i'll put it all in the show notes but um that was the only other time we've gotten cameras into bohemian grove and it was very short-lived and the security there was more mad that a woman had set foot on the property no women allowed but they all got ran off. They had to get back in their canoes and go away. So really, there we've had two times that Bohemian Grove has been invaded fully. And that was Alex Jones and then this guy. I'd love to know what he wrote down. Well, anyways, he you know came to set something on fire, but he couldn't set the owl on fire. There was an empty banquet hall nearby, you know, where you eat food. And he goes, oh, that's made out of wood. <laughs> that, that whole place is made out of wood. I'm going to burn that down. So he took his fire-making materials and went into the banquet hall. And sets it on fire, which causes the, this should be pretty obvious, a bunch of rich people hanging out here, the state-of-the-art fire suppression system kicks in, immediately douses the flame, huge alarm goes off, and Phantom Patriot runs out of the non-burning building and run, ends up running into two workers, two of the staff members who are like, well, they're just sitting there. They're like, oh, no teddy bears on today. It's going to be a slow day at the office. They're just hanging out. All of a sudden, the fire alarm goes off. They're like, what? Huh? And so they go out to check, and then there's a superhero guy running around with a sword and a gun and a crossbow and all this stuff, carrying a stop sign shield. And they're like, oh, let's just let's just call this in, right? I don't know how much I get paid. It's not enough to deal with this. I already got to already got wash all those teddy bear suits every year. Uh, they call the police. The police show up, and he's out running around. They don't know where he's at, but they know where he's going. They find his van. The police surround his van, and the van and Patriot sees it, and he's armed. He has his crossbow. He has his pump-action shotgun slash pump-action rifle. And he sees all these law enforcement around his car, and he actually, in his head, he's thinking... This is it. Like, I'm just going to have a shootout with these guys. And uh, the name Phantom Patriot will go down in history. Like, I'm the guy who invaded Bohemian Grove and then killed a bunch of cops. Maybe, I guess we'll find out how good of a shield this stop sign is. Probably not much. It's probably literally a stop sign. But then, he's sitting there in the forest and he goes, if... I engage in a shootout with these police officers. I will not survive. There's too many of them. And if I do not survive, I will never see Shaylee Wright ever again. And I want to see her. I love her. I want to see her one more time. So he surrendered. And that actually was, I didn't make that, was a joke, that wasn't a joke, that was actually the reason why he surrendered. It could have been a bloodbath. He said he wanted to see Shaylee Wright one more time. Imagine that, imagine you're a stalking victim. And you find out the guy stalking you broke into a place that she'd probably never, <laughs> she's like, what's Bohemian Grove? I doubt she's a huge conspiracy theorist. Imagine if someone's like, hey, Shaylee, remember that guy who was stalking you for a while? She's like, I tried forgetting it. Thanks for bringing it back up. And they're like, yeah, he was in the news. He was in California. He broke into a forest, tried to set a giant owl on fire. She's like, oh, great. What a maniac. And then 
<laughs> police surrounded his car and he almost had this huge shootout. He was dressed like a superhero. <laughs> like, how more absurd can it get? You hope that your stalker is just some weirdo in a ski mask standing in your backyard. You hope he's not a man in a suit of armor with a two-foot-long sword. And he's about to kill a bunch of police officers. But they said, yeah, he apparently, the police surrounded his car. He's dressed up like a superhero. He had a pump-action shotgun slash rifle. And he was going to kill them all, but or they were going to kill him. He was going to die in a hail of bullets and take out as many as police officers as he could. But the reason why he didn't, the reason why he didn't, Shaylee, you're like hoping he did. You're like, I hope the story has a happy ending, Shaylee's thinking. I hope he got his brains blown out. And they're like, nope. Shaylee, the reason why, when the media asked, why didn't he shoot those police officers and have a gun battle with him? Because he wanted to see you one more time. I mean, think about how terrifying that would be. You're like, ah, this guy. This guy's creepier than I could have ever imagined. I thought he was just showing up at my concerts. He has, he has body armor. He has a giant sword. He's a crossbow. Like, no, this is the creepiest possible stalker for Shaylee to ever have. You would It'd be the scariest thing in the world. It'd be so much scarier than just having a run-of-the-mill guy hiding in your bushes. It's a superhero. Why are you supposed to hide from a superhero? It's it's Spider-Man. He's stalking you. Anyway, so he does go to prison for this. He goes to prison for breaking into Bohemian Grove. He, from 2002 to 2008, he has a six-year... He got sentenced to more, but, you know, because of, like, good behavior and stuff like that. He's in prison for only six years. That seems like a lot, too. All he did was, all he did was break into a highly secure compound. Populated by the richest men in America and try to set a fire. But he gets six years in prison. He gets out. And part of his parole was he could not dress up in costumes. He's like, oh man, Halloween. Oh, every year this is the worst. That actually was part of his parole. He had to stay 35 miles away from Bohemian Grove. He could not dress up in costumes. For as long as his parole was. He could not dress up in costumes. Alex Jones disavowed him. Alex Jones goes, listen, I talked to him. We didn't talk anything about this. I didn't know he was going to break in. Totally disavowed him. Threw him under the bus, really. And because Phantom Patriot really looked up to Alex Jones, he, you know, took it to heart. He, He made him feel bad. And he ends up turning to the teachings of David Icke. Richard McCaslin, a.k.a. the Phantom Patriot, decides to start following David Icke, who believes in reptilians, are taking over the planet. So it's not just the Illuminati, it's now this alien invasion. In 2011, Phantom Patriot changes his name once again. Now he is a superhero known as Thought Crime. It's not, not a great name. You have to... Exp- Phantom Patriot was an awesome name. Thought crime, you know, people would be like, so what does that mean? He's like, well, thinking's a crime, and I was arrested. <laughs> You're like, wait, stop. So I thought you were superhero. You were arrested? Yes, yes, I went to prison for committing a thought crime, <laughs> for thinking and then doing a crime by breaking into Bohemian Grove. Thought crime becomes his new name. His costume is basically like black and white striped pants. A belt that says freedom. And his shirt has a smiley face with an exclamation point on the forehead. It's dumb. It's not a really good costume. His shield's gone. He doesn't have any weapons. That might be part of his parole, though. Like, no carrying crossbows in public. Um, He becomes thought crime in 2011. He begins protesting like Obama was giving a speech and he shows up with these signs and saying the Obama is a reptile. Obama is a reptilian. Claims that George Bush is a reptilian. The whole Bush family. Clintons are reptilians. He's really going hardcore on the David Icke train. And you find photos of him at these protests. So let's travel ahead a couple years. October 15th, 2018. Richard McCaslin, a.k.a. Thought Crime, a.k.a. Phantom Patriot, travels to Washington, D.C. 
About one mile from the White House, there's a building called House of the Temple, which is the headquarters, the national headquarters, for the Scottish Rite of Freemasons. A mile from the White House, there is a national headquarters for Freemasons organization. October 15th, 2018. People are just hanging out, walking down the street, going about their lives in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. <laughs> people hear a gunshot. When people try to figure out where the gunshot came from, it leads them to an alleyway right next to the house of the temple. It leads them to a car that is parked in this alleyway. And when they look inside, they see a man sitting there with a fresh bullet wound to the head. In that car sits Richard McCaslin, aged 54 years old, bleeding out from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. He's taken to the hospital, but by the next day, He's dead. He was still alive when they got him out of there, but obviously a gunshot wound to the head. It's, it's an uproad battle to come back from that. He's taken to the hospital. He dies the next day. According to the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, they were able to take out some of his organs. He was an organ donor. And because he didn't die right away from the gunshot wound, because they were able to take him to the hospital and stabilize him for a moment, they were able to take out his kidneys, his lungs, and his liver, which were then donated to people who needed those organs. While that is noble, that his organs saved people's lives, Richard himself died October 16th, 2018, in a hospital in Washington, D.C. So that's the story of the Phantom Patriot. A absolutely insane story. Again, I'm shocked. I've never heard of this story before. Never, ever heard of this story before. I don't even remember coming across that in the news back in 2018. I mean, we were doing the show at that point. I don't think I've ever mentioned any of this before. And this isn't a lark. Like, again, I found so many news articles about this man. And um, the idea of a costume superhero shooting himself outside of a Freemasons building in Washington, D.C., that's already bizarre enough. <laughs> that already is enough to be talked about on the show. But then when you go backwards and you find out about the Bohemian Grove invasion, the stalking allegations, the decades-plus career as a on-the-street real-life superhero, absolutely insane. The big question, obviously, is, and I think is we'll put our conspiracy caps on to finish this up, is did he kill himself? Did he kill himself? We don't, we don't know. We don't know. What's interesting to think about is this is a guy who didn't commit suicide by cop because he wanted to see Shaylee Wright again. It's again, very creepy for her, but... He does time in prison. He doesn't kill himself. He gets out. He believes the world's being taken over by reptilians. He's the only hope stands against it. He's doing all this stuff. He sees himself as a hero. The whole time he sees himself as a hero. So did he kill himself? Like it, It's interesting too because he, like, he left a note at the statue. The owl statue. He left a note there. You would think that if he did kill himself. And again, this is all supposition. He easily could have killed himself. We do not know. Actually, now that I think about it, 2018, there should have video footage. I'm sure, just a guess, I'm sure there's video cameras outside of the headquarters of the Scottish Rites of Freemasons building, a mile from the White House. He didn't leave a note. There's no mention of any sort of suicide note in any of the articles about his suicide. Why would he do it there? I mean, again, unless he's... I mean, if the note said, I can no longer fight against the reptilians, I'm going to bring attention to how dangerous they are by shooting myself outside of one of their buildings or whatever. At least the note. He also had a YouTube channel. 
And there's not, as far as I can find, any manifestos. Because, listen, if you wanted to do that, I think that's a horrible decision. You think reptilians are taking over the planet, so you're going to kill yourself outside of one of their headquarters? I don't think that's a smart call. But if you were going to do that, you think you would explain it. You think you would leave a manifesto. You'd put some video up on your YouTube or TikTok or whatever you're doing. And there's none of that. We just have basically the police officers who investigate it saying it was a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. But was he murdered? Or did he kill himself? I mean, he's 54 years old. An unfortunate statistic is that men, as they get older, the likelihood of them killing themselves go up. This guy seems like he had a lot to live for. He was a super he was a superhero. He was saving people's lives as far as he was concerned. He was taking on an unstoppable force. He was fighting for the little guy. He was fighting for you and me. Why would he kill himself? You could go, Jason, there's a lot of reasons why he might kill himself. Okay, why didn't he leave a note? I know most suicides don't have notes, but this guy documents so much of his life. It's a nice, tidy bow if we say he killed himself. If he killed himself, there's no mystery. It's a story about a man who killed himself. And really, that's not the story. I never like people's stories to be just how they died. The, the, his story is a man who was fighting for justice and a little bit of stalking on the side. You can't forget that part. But he also did terrify a woman. But he was a stalker, but he also was a superhero. He was trying to make the world a better place. The way he died, I don't want that to be... He always just a man who committed suicide. I don't mean like that, but... If he committed suicide, then you can go, well, that's the story of the Phantom Patriot. A man who believed in crazy things and did something crazy at the end. He killed himself outside of a Freemason's building. And a little bow on it. Story's over. Uh, but did he kill himself, or was he assassinated? Was he going to go into that building and somebody shot him to stop him from doing that? And then just to make it all easy, the cops just said, uh, yeah, it was suicide. Or was it a setup? Was it a setup? Did they invite him there to kill him? Make it look like a suicide. Was he getting ready to go in and someone saw him and shot him? Like there's a hundred different ways you could look at it, right? He could have been set up and brought there where it was kind of a private place to take him out. He could have had someone else in the car with him. He drove to this location. That person shot him as a setup and got out. Security could have shot him, trying to stop him from going in. Because I'm telling you right now, that's probably what would have happened. He does not seem like the type of guy who just pulls up in an alleyway of a building and goes, ah, this is good enough. He broke into Bohemian Grove. He was going to Obama's speeches and calling him a reptilian, standing outside. He was definitely not a wilting lily. My guess is that he went there to go raise hell. And whether or not security took him out or it was a setup, it might have been suicide, but I think he was going there to kick in the doors. That's my read on it. And he was killed in the process, or maybe he got there and shot himself. Again, that just seems very out of character for somebody like that who wanted to be a hero. I can understand if he was like homeless, living underneath the bridge in Texas, and he's just looking at his life in shambles. All of his money is gone. His reputation's gone. He can't dress up as a superhero. Alex Jones doesn't like him, so he shoots himself. It almost seems to me like he had one more mission. He had one more task that he wanted to do, and he was taken out before he did it. Which, in that case, I'm not faulting the Freemasons if a guy shows up to your headquarters with a pump-action shotgun rifle and a two-foot-long sword. I'm not saying that the Freemasons had to let him in and do whatever he was going to do. If security took him out, I totally understand why they did that. Could have been a setup. Could have been a symbolic revenge for breaking into Bohemian Grove. Who knows? Who knows? It could have been suicide. 100% could have been suicide. We don't know. I just find it odd that there's no note. No, there's not always notes with suicides, but he does seem to be the type of guy who would leave a note. But that is the story of Phantom Patriot, a story of a man of mystery lurking in the shadows whose story ends mysteriously as well. Fantastic, fantastic story. It's sad. 
right? The ending's sad and the stalking part's sad. It's a little terrifying, but overall, absolutely fascinating story. A man who wanted to be a hero, so he became one. But then he took the battle from the streets to the elites. First time he did it, it got him sent to prison. And the second time he did it may have been the reason why he was killed. We'll never know the answer to how he died. But he did leave us one hell of a theme song. So let's listen to this. As we give Phantom Patriot, a.k.a. Richard McClaslin, a good old-fashioned salute. You're like, Jason, he was a stalker. He was a stalker. He terrified a woman. Don't salute him. Richard McClaslin, forget the whole stalking part. Forget that part. Forget all the horrible stuff he did. Let's just look at him standing there in his dope suit as the Phantom Patriot, living in a giant silver dome out in the middle of the desert. Let us listen to his theme song and forget that he's a stalker. I will argue, though, it's probably he might also be the only stalker who has a theme song. Phantom Patriot, we salute you. The Phantom Patriot fights to protect American liberty from the socialist schemes of the New World Order. Yet, even a real-life superhero needs his downtime. So, join the scourge of Bohemian Grove and his extraterrestrial co-host as they present The Phantom Patriots Retro Cinema. 